Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Leopold, and uh, I'm a senior investigative reporter over at uh, BuzzFeed News on the investigations team. And uh, if you didn't know, BuzzFeed News does have uh, an investigations team of about uh, 20 or so people. And uh, I've been there for about four years, and we use uh, the Freedom of Information Act quite aggressively. Uh, we litigate often uh, against uh, federal and state agencies to try and pry loose records. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna get into uh, a little bit of background about how I started to aggressively use the Freedom of Information Act and then get into a little bit of the basics just to, as a refresher for those who may not be too familiar with it. Um, and, uh, and just kind of talk about ways in which it can get records. So, you know, for me, I started using the Freedom of Information Act quite aggressively about 12, 12 or 13 years ago. And uh, at the time I had been covering uh, the, uh, I, I guess you could call it the, you know, we, or what we have called it the, uh, you know, post 9-11 war on terror. Uh, and that meant really covering, uh, uh, covert operations involving CIA, NSA, uh, Department of Defense, um, issues like uh, uh, Guantanamo and, uh, you know, detainees that are that were being held there. Uh, and so everything that I was covering at that time uh, was the information that I was gleaning was, uh, was based on anonymous sources. And so it got to a point where, you know, trusting things that anonymous sources, you know, would say uh, was, was called into question. And so I was looking for, you know, to kind of make a long story short, I was looking for a way in which I can obtain information, documentary evidence about some of the things that these people, you know, these intelligence officials were saying. Um, and so the, the Freedom of Information Act was, uh, was one way to do that. I mean, basically, it's you know anything short of getting leaked documents, which uh, which doesn't really happen that often. You know, there's there's instances here and there where you can get a document, a cable, uh, something that's classified, but it doesn't happen you know on a, on a on a very frequent basis. So, you know, how to kind of essentially keep these agencies. Uh, uh, let, let the public know what these agencies are up to, I saw the Freedom of Information Act as a way to do that. And uh, so I started out with basically, uh, you know, just filing requests with, uh, with the Department of Homeland Security around Occupy Wall Street. And this was about, um, I guess this was about 2010. And, uh, you know, what, what I learned at that time is, one, you can ask for anything that you want. You know, you can ask for emails, you can ask for memos, you can ask for talking points, you can ask for classified records, the agencies don't have to give it to you. Um, but uh, essentially what you can do is, you know, you craft a request, uh, you draft a request and, you know, state exactly what you're looking for. So let me just get into the, you know, into the basics uh, about, um, you know, what types of government records you can request. Uh, requests can target any records such as decisions by government officials, policies, data, communications, which, which means emails, letters, text messages, maps, videos and audio recordings, um, records of investigation, uh, and uh, on the state and local level, uh, you can get access to legislative records, transcripts, bills, voting records, uh, and things like that. Um, the one, th what you should know, what you can't request, okay, is that the FOIA, the FOIA does apply to many administrative courts and proceedings, such as the Executive Office of Immigration Review, uh, which is part of the Department of Justice, uh, or the Office of the Administrative Law Judge at the SEC. Um, but, uh, you know, FOIA may apply to certain communications also between elected officials and federal agencies, but it's, you, you can't ask for congressional records. So, you know, early on, I was given a tip, you know, uh, I was given a tip by a, a, 
other people who are very savvy FOIA requesters. And like I said, I was trying to get in from, I was trying to get away from using anonymous sources. So I started to request records from CIA, um, from the Department of Defense, from the NSA, from, from the intelligence agencies. And what I was told early on, and this has proven to be very valuable, is try to build a pipeline. And building a pipeline is very, very important because the agencies, particularly now, are backlogged. So if you get in, you know, requests on a, on a frequent basis, if you can file, you know, uh, more than 10 per month, you know, and for some people that's a lot, um, there will get to a, there will be a point in time where the agencies have to process your request and you will start to see a regular flow of mail, a regular, a regular uh, flow of documents into your mailbox uh, several times per week. And that's certainly been the case, uh, you know, with me um, for, you know, for a wide range of records. So when planning your request, um, you know, there's a, there's a strategy you want to start out with, you know, and these, and this is important uh, when, when you're thinking about, you know, filing a FOIA request, which is, do you want a long-term process to net a comprehensive set of documents? Or are you looking for a quicker process that targets a, narrow, a narrower, smaller set of documents? And that's something that's really important to think about. And here's why. As I mentioned, these agencies on the federal level are backlogged. And that what that means is that they're dealing with uh, hundreds, if not in, thousands of requests. Many people ask for a broad set of records. So they'll file a request with an agency and they'll say that they want um, emails covering, you know, the course of, uh, of a year or maybe even six months. Getting those records could then take, you know, a, uh, in, in some instances, depending on the agency, could take, you know, a couple of years to actually get through that. So it's really important to kind of think about what you're looking for and how to target it. And, you know, by doing so, by coming up with like an actual timeline and, target, and targeting uh, a smaller set of documents, you can actually get your records a bit faster. Um, and what I mean by faster is, you know, say within six months, um, depending, again, depending on uh, the agency. But if you're looking for, you know, a broader set of records, um, that's something that you should think about. One, do you have the resources for a longer process? Is this part of a, you know, an investigative, uh, um, you know, an investigation that you're undertaking? Um, uh, is, is it, are, are you prepared to litigate? Whenever I file a request, particularly when I'm looking for you know, a broader set of records, I pretty much know that I'm probably going to litigate for those records. Uh, so I think about that each time, you know, uh, uh, before I'm filing the request. Um, one of the other things, again, again in, you know, when, you, when you're filing uh, for requests, uh, when I look at uh, other uh, journalists for your requests, um, is that you have to make sure that you put in there that uh, uh, you're entitled to a fee waiver. Oftentimes, you know, journalists don't do that. And they're, I'll, I'll see complaints from journalists that, uh, you know, the agencies are charging them, you know, an exorbitant amount of, uh, of money for the records. Um, and essentially what is required, it's, it's, it's on the journalist to actually say, you know, how these records are going to be used, right? So uh, when you're putting a request together, it's really important for the journalist to say that one, you intend to use these records to inform the public about actual government activity. And therefore this is not, you know, a commercial request and that you would be entitled to a fee waiver. So it's very important to, you know, state in your request how these records would be used and why you would be entitled to a fee waiver. Um, again, timing under FOIA. 
So when you file the request, the, uh, the agency has 20 business days to, uh, to respond. And essentially what they're supposed to do under the law is actually give you, they're supposed to give you records within that time frame. We all know that never happens. Uh, and the reason it never happens is again, you know, they're, they're backlogged, they may have to review the records, there may be, you know, uh, issues in the request that you're filing that uh, requires another agency to review. Agencies also under the law can ask for a 10 day extension. So uh, that sort of extends the time frame to, you know, to 30, uh, 30 business days. What's really crucial, and I also try to tell this to, uh, to requesters whenever they file a request, no matter what it is, is that under the FOIA, okay, and, and, and given that we're journalists, you can ask for expedited processing. So expedited processing provides that requester, requesters can be granted expedited processing if you can demonstrate a compelling need where compelling need is defined as failure to obtain documents could pose an imminent threat to the life or physical safety of an individual, or if the requester is uh, primarily engaged in disseminating information or there's an urgency to inform the public of government activity. Um, so it's really important when you're putting a request together and obviously if you're requesting records that uh, you know, may, may, you know, may deal with, uh, for example, the election or uh, Black Lives Matter protests, you can ask that agency to process your requests on an expedited basis, but it's up to you, the requester, to demonstrate why there is, you know, why, why there, why it's a, a, there should be a compelling need, or why there is a compelling need, and why they should uh, uh, process it uh, quicker. Essentially, put you on the top of the pile. So, that's uh, that's something that. I put into every single request. I try to come up with the language. I try to come up with why I need these records quickly. And uh, in some instances, you know, you can get the records, um, you know, months, years earlier than you than you normally would. Uh, you know, if if you did not ask for expedited processing, essentially, it allows you to go to, you know, the top of the pile. Um, drafting the request. So, bef you know, what, what's the most crucial part, in my opinion, of, um, you know, of filing a FOIA request is to have a, you know, a solid template. Um, and the template, which I'll bring up in a, a, a little bit to kind of give you an example, uh, the template should be an instructional manual to the agency. And it should identify specifically the records that you're seeking, uh, where those records could be located, who the, the custodians of the records are, and uh, the, uh, what, what is referred to as the system of record, where those records may be stored. So prior to filing a FOIA request, what I'll do is, um, is I will look at a specific agency system of record and I would encourage everyone to take a look uh, at that as well. And you can basically do a Google search uh, and find that. So for example, let's say the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security is a massive government agency that has multiple components within that department. Um, and so let's talk about the Office of Intelligence and Analysis within the Department of Homeland Security. If you were to type into, into Google, you know, Department of Homeland Security, Office of Intelligence and, and Analysis, System of Record, it will bring up uh, a, a, a listing of the types of records uh, that are stored there and the types of records you can request uh, and where those records are stored. And then you can take that information and put it into your, uh, your FOIA request. So uh, uh, for example, there's you know, intelligence bulletins that, um, 
you know, that, that are uh, very, very newsworthy, as a matter of fact, on, uh, on a wide range of topics. Uh, and those are the types of, um, those are the types of documents that, that you can ask for, and that would go into uh, your FOIA request. Uh, when ask, when, when targeting your request to the Department of Homeland Security Office of Intelligence and Analysis. Um, so let me just see here, I'm just looking at my template. Um, another thing that you want to do is uh, make sure that your, you know, your request reasonably describes the information that you're seeking. So basically the FOIA, you know, requ simply requires that you reasonably describe the information that you're seeking. But oftentimes when we put our request together, the analysts that are looking at, uh, that are looking at the request, they're left having to, having to interpret what essentially it is you're asking for. And that's something you never, ever want to happen. You never want an analyst to kind of figure out, you know, what it is that you're looking for, because the, you know, what, what will happen is you'll never get uh, the types of records that you're, uh, that you're essentially hoping to get. Um, so that's why it's very important prior to putting your request together that you, you conduct the research. You look at the agency's organizational chart, right? So if you're filing a request with the State Department, um, it's very important to look at the State Department organizational chart or the CIA's organizational chart and try to understand which section or which division within that agency may have the records that you're looking for. Um, you know, there's a, uh, within CIA, there's a counterterrorism, you know, section um, and a clandestine section. And so some age, some divisions or some components may not have the records that you're, that you're looking for. And if you just ask for a broad set of records, what's gonna happen is, is that the agency is gonna come back at you and say, your request is too broad. And, you know, if, if, if a month is gonna go by and, or two months is gonna go by and you're gonna lose time where you could have, uh, uh, if you were to conduct that research prior to get those records. So it's very important to kind of, you know, to do that kind of research uh, prior to putting a request together and understanding how an agency is structured and what the organizational chart looks like. Again, all of this you can, you can just Google, but it's very important to, you know, to put it together prior to drafting a request. Um, another thing that's, you know, that's kind of crucial is define the terms that you decide to use in your request. And this will help you and the government identify what you're looking for. Um, for example, you know, in this request, record includes, but is not limited to all records or communications preserved in electronic, including metadata or written form, such as correspondence, emails, documents, data, videotapes, audio tapes, faxes, files, guidelines, evaluations. This is, this is very important to include this language. Um, I'll make all of this, by the way, available for anyone on this call uh, or on this uh, on the Zoom call. If you have any questions, I'll be able to, uh, you know, to send all of this to you. Um, it's also very important in your request to specify that you seek both paper and electronic records, um, and that you specify the format of production. Uh, and and the reason for this is that. Uh, Again, you know, the agency will ask you, you know, uh, do, you, do, you want a, uh, do, you, do you want it on CD? Do you want it uh, uh, via email? And again, all of these things can slow down your request. So it's important to specify if you want to receive your, how you want to receive your documents. Um, and one thing that is, again, that is very crucial after filing the request is, waiting a few weeks as, as journalists what happens is you know we file the request and then we kind of just sit back and wonder is the agency what you know when are we going to get these documents is the agency ever going to respond to me under the law you are entitled to ask the agency 
for an estimated date of completion. So that's really important in kind of understanding what your next step would be. So for example, if you filed a request with the FBI and um, you know, let's say you're asking for an investigative file, uh, you have no idea when it's, you know, wh when they'll get to your request, but you can, you know, say about three weeks after you file your request, you can reach out to the FBI, the FOIA public liaison, and you can ask for an estimated date of completion on the request you just filed. And then the agency by law has to provide that to you. And again, it's just estimated, but it'll give you an idea of what your next step is. So for example, I recently reached out to you know, the NSA on a request that I filed in May, May of this year, and asked them what the uh, estimated date of completion is. Uh, and they told me it was gonna be in 2000, uh, November 2022. Well, that's actually too long for me to wait for, you know, to wait for those records. So I have two options. One, I can narrow the request, right? I can actually ask for a smaller set of documents or I can sue. And um, that's likely what I'll do is, you know, I'll sue for those, uh, for those records. Um, but, uh, you know, that gives you an idea of, of, you know, what you can do next and figure out how you can get those records. Um, so basically what, um, you know, what you can expect after you file a request, uh, again, this may, you know, the, the, this may be basic for some of you, is that the agency will alert you that your request has been received. Um, they'll let you know whether they're gonna invoke the 10 day extension. Um, they may contact you and they often will contact you uh, for clarification of parts of your requests. Um, you know, essentially, what did you mean by any and all records uh, or any and all records is too broad. Um, they'll ask, they may ask you to describe the documents you know, that you're seeking, uh, provide a bit more information about where those documents may be located. Again, they'll ask you things that you that you're gonna, you know, your immediate response may be, I don't know, you know, you're, you know, this is why I'm filing the request. But a lot of this information you can get beforehand um, just by conducting, a, you know, a bit of a search. And um, it's very important that whenever you do communicate with the agency that you you know, you do so in writing, you know, don't, if they're asking, if they're calling you up, you know, ask, tell them that you want it, uh, tell them that you want it in writing. So filing the request is kind of like the, you know, the basics. It's, uh, uh, that, that's kind of the easy part, um, but it's just the beginning because, you know, what's going to happen in, in many of the requests that you file is that, you know, you may get a denial um, where the agency says that they're, you know, they're withholding all the records and they're, they're not going to give you anything. And that's where the appeals come in. It is crucial to appeal, to always appeal. Um, any, administ any denial of your FOIA request, you should always, always appeal. Um, and the, uh, the Freedom of Information Act, you know, permits you to appeal any adverse determination. Uh, for example, if a department states that they searched and found no records responsive to your request, you can appeal that response. You can simply just say, I appeal the integrity of the search um, and ask them to search again. And this happened with me um, with, I believe it was the Federal Election Commission. Um, in 2016, I asked for, I asked for a bunch of records. Uh, they said that they couldn't find any records, I appealed it, and they suddenly found 900 pages of records. So it's really important that, you know, that you appeal any denial um, that, uh, that you receive. And, you know, again, I understand that this is tedious, you know, that uh, the FOIA is, you know, it's a bit of a battle. Um, in fact, it's a, it's a huge battle to get documents, but it's really, really crucial that, um, you know, that, that you wage this war because the agencies are not, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to just simply give up the records that you're looking for simply because you ask. You, you have to fight for these records. 
um, you have 90 days to appeal any adverse decision, and then the agencies have 20 days to respond. Um, and make sure that all the, uh, all the issues you want to appeal, um, which also includes any full or partial denial of fee, of fee waivers, uh, are included in the administrative appeal. Um, you know, there are many different, the, the FOIA has nine different exemptions. And there are many different ways you can appeal uh, depending on the exemption that's invoked. Um, I often hold, you know, offer my you know, guidance to anyone who, who may have questions about that because uh, there, there's no sort of, blank, there's no real blanket um, appeal language. It, it kind of, well, there is in some instances, but it depends on what exemption is being used. So, um, Again, you know, you can reach out to me specifically if there's a, if, if you have any questions about uh, how to appeal a specific, uh, a specific exemption. Um, another thing that's really, really important with, um, you know, with FOIA is often we'll get documents, they'll be heavily redacted, and that's it. You know, we, we, we sort of just throw our hands up and say, uh, you know, these are, these are not uh, usable. Um, anytime I receive records, I always, always appeal the redactions. So agencies will redact any information from a document that they believe is exempt, you know, under FOIA from disclosure. And they'll often exempt, uh, excuse me, they'll often redact uh, a record simply to, uh, to hide, you know, embarrassing information. In fact, I just uh, tweeted out um, an email that I received from uh, the TSA uh, yesterday that uh, they actually forgot to, re they, they marked an email for redaction and they actually forgot to apply the redactions. And the exemption that they were going to apply um, you know, to, this, uh, to this email that they were going to redact was you know one of the most abused FOIA exemptions, and the information that they were going to to hide behind a redaction was simply information that you know may have been embarrassing, um, but there was no reason for them to you know to redact it. So that was actually something that came in yesterday, that was you know just a really good example of how agencies you know redact information and why it's crucial that uh, you always appeal that. So whenever I receive documents, you know, from an agency um, that's heavily redacted, I'll appeal it. And uh, oftentimes after I appeal it, you know, they'll, uh, they'll, send, it, they'll send it back a, a bit less redacted. Um, so very quickly to go over the nine exemptions under FOIA, um, you know, it's information that's, uh, you know, the first exemption is um, uh, B1, information that is authorized by executive order to be kept secret in the interest of uh, national defense or foreign policy, um, and is uh, in fact properly classified pursuant to executive order 13526. Um, there's information related solely to the inner internal personnel rules and practices of an agency. Uh, documents exempted by a statute other than FOIA. Uh, there is a, uh, an exemption for trade secrets and commercial or financial information obtained from a person and privileged uh, or confidential. This is the most abused FOIA exemption. It's uh, the B5 exemption. Uh, inter or intra-agency memoranda letters that would not be available in litigation uh, against the agency or uh, documents that are attorney-client privilege or that reveal deliberative process. It's the deliberative process that the agencies often use to hide uh, embarrassing information. Personnel and medical files and similar files, uh, the disclosure, excuse me, the disclosure of which uh, constitute uh, a clearly unwarranted invasion of privacy. That's the B6 exemption. I have fantastic language uh, to use in an appeal 
if anyone ever gets uh, the B6 uh, uh, exemption. And um, then you have B7, information compiled for law enforcement purposes. Uh, and there's an, a, a number of um, uh, subcomponents to that. Um, one that's not often used is uh, uh, B9, which is uh, geological and geophysical information and data, including maps concerning wells. Um, and then information contained in reports prepared by or, or for the use of agencies responsible for the regulation or supervision of financial institution. Um, all right, next up is, is litigation. So this is my favorite. You know, I have uh, often, often, you know, sued government agencies uh, in order to pry loose records uh, simply because it's, you know, it's sadly the fastest way to get, you know, the documents that I'm seeking. And, uh, you know, it, it allows you, uh, you know, the, the filing of a lawsuit entitles you to court oversight over your request. Um, and that's why when I say, when I said earlier that your template should really, 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 you know, be solid is because if you decide to litigate, um, it's really important that when you go into court that the language in your template, you know, is bulletproof. So an agency can't say we, you know, we, we were not clear what, um, you know, what you were what you were asking for, uh, or we didn't understand what you were seeking. So it's very very important to um, you know to make sure the language in the template is uh, is solid. Um, and sorry, give me one second here. One of the things that's you know that I also want to kind of dispel this myth is that you know, filing a lawsuit is going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. That's not the case. And I understand that newsrooms, um, you know, are, are strapped these days um, in, in terms of, you know, filing lawsuits for a specific set of records and that it's, you know, uh, financially, it's, it's not feasible to do so. Uh, but there are uh, certainly other ways in which you can try and get records short of litigation, you know, you can, you can seek out the FOIA ombudsman uh, to, uh, you know, to, to try to negotiate with an agency uh, if, that's a, if that's a path you want to take. But there are lawyers out there that, you know, that will essentially, you know, work either, you know, on a fee shifting basis um, or, you know, just, just for attorney's fees. Um, so it, it, you know, filing a lawsuit, it's, it's simply just trying to get to, sadly, to the top of the pile. And that's what we're doing here. Um, when I, when we're filing lawsuits, when I'm filing lawsuits is trying to get those records faster because otherwise, you know, we're just waiting for, uh, we're waiting in line and it could be years to get it. Um, so, you know, I have some guidance for, for anyone who's, who, who's thinking about that, um, as well. Uh, I want to go into, um, I'd like to go into the template right now. And this is, um, Tom, can you bring that up? So I want to give uh, a little, oh, I left my address there. Well, now you guys know where I live. So let me go into the, um, uh, this template. This is I'd be happy to make this available, you know, to, to everyone, but let me, let me describe what this, you know, what this template is. Uh, this is a real solid FOIA template. This is a, a, a request that I had filed to the CIA um, a couple of years ago, and it is for records about the, uh, the I, I was looking for records from the CIA um, about the CIA arming Syrian rebels. So let me just start at the top here. Um, so the CIA is one of those agencies, by the way, that 
still, ex you know, accepts FOIA, only accepts FOIA through the mail or believe it or not through fax. So uh, here at the top, you know, I just have, you know, uh, I'm, I'm addressing it to the, uh, the information and privacy coordinator at the CIA. Um, in the second paragraph here, I'm explaining, you know, this is a, re a request for records under the Freedom of Information Act. I list the statutes and I'm telling the agency that this request should be considered under both statutes, you know, which is, you know, the, the Privacy Act and, you know, the overall Freedom of Information Act. Um, I have my information here about myself. Uh, Tom, we can scroll down a bit. Okay, we'll just stop there. So this is the request, this is what I was asking the CIA. Um, and the genesis of this request uh, was a tweet by President Trump uh, on July 24th, 2017, in which Donald Trump had tweeted that he was, um, as we can see here, the, he, the, the, I'm gonna paraphrase, but the Washington Post wrote a story that suggested that the CIA was arming Syrian rebels, fighting Assad. Donald Trump tweeted that he was ending this program. So that was something that is known as in, how I interpreted it as a uh, instant declassification. Um, I had been trying to get these types of records since, uh, since Obama was president. Um, and the CIA had issued what is known as a GLOMAR, which they can neither confirm nor deny that these records existed. And the only way to defeat a GLOMAR is by having um, an official disclosure by an original classification authority. And Donald Trump as president is, the, uh, is an original classification authority. And this is something that I felt, you know, that, that we believed was, you know, an official disclosure. So because he tweeted that, I was able to request, you know, this is what I requested. Um, it's a nine part request. And it's very, as you can see, it's very specific any and all studies, memos, assessments, um, intelligence products, right? The CIA has various intelligence products, um, mentioning or referring to payments, you know, to Syrian rebels fighting Assad, any and all emails mentioning or referring to. It's very important to keep, to, to notice those, uh, that word mention, or those two words mentioning or referring. Um, sometimes an agency will tell you they don't, if, if you were to say any and all emails about, they would come back at you and say, well, we're not quite sure what you mean about. So mentioning or referring to is very specific. And those are the words that you wanna use in your request. Um, any and all correspondence to or from a member of Congress, uh, uh, mentioning or referring to payments. Um, and then this tweet, Right, this is Donald Trump's tweet. So very curious to know whether or not, you know, the CIA, when they saw this tweet, what their response was. Um, you know, and it goes on and I go on in, in, in the various, and uh, asking for these various records. Now, the CIA denied this request um, and we appealed uh, again, they issued, invoked a Glomar, um, we appealed and we won. We won uh, this case and the CIA is now appealing to uh, the uh, US District Court of Appeals in DC. Um, they really don't want to turn over the records as you can imagine and they're uh, based on this, on this Trump tweet. But uh, this, was, this was really a, an important win for us in terms of, you know, defeating this Glomar, which does not happen often. But I want to get down to, you know, why this is, you know, why having a template is very important. Because when you have a template that's solid, all you need to do is, uh, is just plug in this part of the request, right? Everything else would stay the same. You would just need to plug in the records that you're seeking. So let's scroll down a bit 
to uh, this reasonably foreseeable harm. Under the FOIA, um, uh, uh, under the FOIA, there were amendments that were passed in 2016 um, that were supposed to make it easier for requesters to obtain records. And that's this reasonably foreseeable harm standard. This language goes into every single request that I file. Why? Because you want to remind the agencies, you want to remind them that they need to, before they decide to, you know, deny you records, they need to apply this standard. They need, if they're going to deny you records, they need to, to, to show you what the reasonably foreseeable harm would be. And so again, this language um, states, as you can see, you know, what the agency is required to do. Um, and it's basically putting the agency on notice. Again, this is important if you're going to, if, if, you, um, if you decide to litigate, um, it's gonna be important if you're denied you know, certain records um, and they do not disclose what the harm is when you appeal, uh, you'll have it all in your request. So this is standard language that I include in my request. Uh, and as you can see, I say here, and I change it for each agency. I say CIA should not fail to meet the requirements of this section when processing my request and release responsive records to me in full or at least in part. And you can change that with, you know, whichever agency you're dealing with. Um, we can go down on the uh, instructions regarding the search. <laughs> Again, this is, for me, standard language that I put into every single one of my requests. And it puts the agency on notice and lets them know what kinds of records I'm looking for. So I'm looking for public records, right? So there may be some records that consist of news clippings. You know, an agency will also look at, you know, press releases or an agency will, will process press releases or news clippings. Um, I'm requesting electronic and paper manual searches, right? So I don't want them to just search records that are, um, you know, in an electronic filing system. They may have a box of records that are, you know, that, that, that's sitting next to a file cabinet. I want them to search those records. Um, that's why I say here, filing systems and locations for any and all records relating or referring to the subject of my request. So I, I'm, it's not just limited, you know, to the, um, to an electronic filing system. And the filing systems, you know, it, it's very, very important to become familiar with that. Um, because some agencies still rely on a paper, you know, a paper index. Um, and, uh, and believe it or not, you know, locked cabinets, I mean, that's, that's actually a thing that, you know, that still exists. Um, and again, you know, number three here, you know, photographs and other visual materials. Agencies have lots and lots of photographs. You know, I just filed a request with the Department of Homeland Security um, with the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, the Federal Protective Service for photographs that they had about uh, Black Lives Matter protests uh, in Portland. I wanted to see, you know, what kinds of photographs they were taking, um, and uh, and they they provided that to me. So I asked for photographs and and all sorts of visual records. And again, standard language. This is if the agency comes back to me and says, "Look, you know, it, do you want to narrow your request? We can get it to you. Um, we can get you records um, faster." If you limit it to, you know, a certain set of records, then I may choose to omit photographs or omit public records, uh, or even on the next one, duplicate pages. So on the duplicate pages, I ask for that because sometimes I'll just, you know, there is a, a chain of emails, and and they'll just give you one email 
uh, thread. I want the, you know, the whole chain. It's just, frankly, it's just the types of records that I want. Um, and uh, so again, standard language that I put in there, I can limit it if the, if the agency uh, decides or, or if the agency tells me that it's gonna, um, it's going to take too long to, uh, to process it. Um, emails, I request them to search emails and uh, records that are transferred to other agencies. Very, very important. So um, sometimes, sometimes records are, you know, transferred to other agencies, you know, if, if they're, maybe they're historic records, maybe they're being housed, um, uh, you know, in, in a filing system at another agency. And I, and I want the agency that I'm requesting, whether it's the Department of Defense, you know, to speak with the department, uh, excuse me, with a defense intelligence agency and try to get records through them um, or search those records. So again, what this is here, this is putting the agency on notice that this is how I want them to conduct the search. This is what I'm asking for. Um, and then if we can scroll down to format, as I mentioned, you know, I request that, you know, uh, that these records be provided to me in, you know, digital format uh, or, or electronically. Now the fee category and, and request for a fee waiver, um, again, I put this language in. I let the agency know who I am, where I've worked, how these records may be used. Um, and I don't just say I'm a journalist, therefore, you know, you should waive all fees. I let them know that, you know, um, what the language, you know, what, what, what the FOIA language states and, and why I am entitled to a fee waiver. Um, we can scroll down a bit more. Um, and then I let them know if, you know, if I'm not granted a complete fee waiver, you know, make sure they put me in the news requester category and that I'll, you know, I'll deny, um, or excuse me, that I'll uh, appeal any denial of the fee waiver. So um, again, this is a FOIA template. This took a while to kind of build this, but if we can just scroll back up to the documents requested um, right there. So again, whenever I'm filing a request now, all I'm doing is just plugging this information in. And I'm just you know plugging that in, everything else is set. It makes it, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's more efficient. It's why I can file requests faster. This is not the way everyone does it. I make sure that each and every one of my requests are litigation proof because I may decide to sue. So I want to have, you know, a solid template. Um, a couple of tips. All right. That's, that is it for the template. And again, I'll make that, um, available to anyone. Um, uh, excuse me, sorry about that. So one of the other things I wanna, um, I wanna just go through now is, you know, how to approach FOIA. Um, I approach the Freedom of Information Act like an investigative story. Um, like I said, it's not often that, you know, you get, as journalists, we can obtain documents. It's very difficult. Sources don't, you know, sources are, are, are fearful of just handing out documents. So the Freedom of Information Act is a really, really, really powerful tool. Um, you know, getting documents is a battle. You're, you're going to war with the agency. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's tedious, but the payoff can be huge. So I, I, I do approach it like an investigative story. And that means I seek out sources who can provide me with details about rec certain records that exist, whether it's, you know, the CIA, um, you know, it's, it's a, whether it's a certain memo um, or, or letter, um, 
you know, I try to find people who work at agencies who can simply, you know, provide information. And that's why prior to filing a FOIA request, I am putting in an, an, quite a bit of research um, into what the records, you know, what the records are that I'm, you know, that, that I'm seeking or, or getting to learn about the records and also learning about the agency, you know, trying to find out how that agency uh, is structured, um, what the organizational chart looks like, what each division does. Um, again, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm trying to get the records, you know, on a, on a more expedited basis. Um, so I'm, by doing this, I know that it will save, will save me, uh, you know, months of time in getting the, rec the records. This is a very important, um, you know, very important tip whenever you're filing a request with the FBI. Now the FBI is an investigative agency and it's, uh, they, they maintain, largely the records that they maintain is in, is in one, you know, big filing system, the central record system. There's, I think over a hundred million records in there. Um, and so the FBI, which is by the way, one of the worst agencies to deal with when it comes to FOIA. Um, I hate to say it, but, it, but they are terrible. Uh, it's very, very important to know that there's obviously other types of records, you know, that exist besides investigative records. And um, that's why whenever you're filing a request with FBI, you should ask for investigative and non-investigative records always say investigative and non-investigative records because what they will do is they will simply search one filing system. You also want to at, make sure in your request you ask for cross-reference searches. So if you're asked, if, if, and you have to put that in writing. So the FBI may have, I'm just trying to think of, uh, you know, of, uh, of an example here. Um, it, it, I mean, it could be on an individual, a deceased individual that you're seeking records about um, where, you know, that, that person could be in another, another filing system. So essentially you wanna ask for them to conduct a cross-reference search. Um, that means that let's say they opened up an investigation on, um, I don't know, the Trump organization, the business, and there's a document in that file so um, that's a type of record that they could provide you with if you were to ask for a cross-reference search. So always ask for um, investigative and non-investigative records uh, when, when, uh, when seeking out records from the FBI. Um, I did mention this earlier, but I also you know, wanna say it again. Prior to filing your request, get familiar with the agency's organizational chart. Um, the organizational chart will tell will will show you you know what you know how the agency is broken down and will give you a bit of bit more insight into telling the uh, or putting in your request what you know what sections should be searched. Uh, again, you can just Google that DHS you know organizational chart, uh, State Department organizational chart um, that. Uh, that will save you some time. Um, the last thing I want to talk about here is mandatory declassification review. And that's a way in which you can get records a bit faster, possibly, depending on the, <clears throat> uh, depending on the agency, depending on the types of record it is, of course, that you're seeking. But um, this deals with intelligence agencies. So let's say you know a specific record exists on a, you know, you know the date, you know the title of a record, um, you know, you, you, you know, know when it was, you know, when it was written, whatever details you have about it, specific details, you know that it's classified. Excuse me, you can ask an agency to conduct a mandatory declassification review under Executive Order 13526, um, 
and they will, you know, for and, and for that specific record, uh, and you know, they would they would you, essentially it, it's kind of like FOIA. It's not the same, but they would conduct a review. It, there's it's done by a panel. Um, and there, the, the statistics are a bit higher uh, in terms of in favor of the requester in order to get that record, uh, to get a record that way. It's best used for historical records um, as opposed to any, any newer in, uh, uh, classified records. Um, you know, say with you know, something that's maybe 25 years or older or even, you know, 15 to 20 years or older. Um, or even asking an agency to, you know, there's a document that, you know, has already been released and you want more information and, and it's redacted and you want additional information, possibly unredacted. And so they can, you know, you can ask an agency to, you know, conduct a mandatory declassification review on a specific document that has already been released. Um, so it's just a different method um, of um, uh, uh, of conducting uh, a uh, of using using the uh, a request to get records. Um, also, you know, I wanted to note that uh, going back to the FBI, and again, you know, one of the things that you may find with the FBI is that the FBI will say. You know, if you're asking for specific records, they may say to you, um, we can't disclose these records because disclosure would interfere with an ongoing investigation. That's, uh, or ongoing law enforcement proceeding. That's an exemption known as B7A. And there's a way to appeal that. Now the FBI has to, you know, if they're going to invoke that, that exemption, they have to um, conduct a document by document uh, search um, to ensure that there are no records that are segregable, um, you know, before invoking that exemption. Now the FBI never does that, uh, which is why I have specific appeal language for that, you know, when, uh, whenever you get that exempt, you know, that exemption. Um, again, you know, I, I'll make this available. I'm sure there's, a way to ensure that everyone can get this information, um, but I, you know, it's 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 a way to ensure that you can get, you know, you can get some documents, um, and yes. So one of the last things um, that I wanted to, uh, this is the last thing actually I want to mention is that. Um, you know, the FOIA requires agencies to conduct, you know, a search reasonably calculated to uncover all relative documents. Um, that doesn't often happen. Um, and it's, again, on the requester, you know, uh, to demonstrate that, you know, an agency didn't conduct a reasonable search. So, you know, oftentimes I'll file a request, it'll take a couple of years, you know, if I'm not suing, to get the records back and it's, you know, maybe it's 10 pages, you know, I will then ask the agency to explain how it conducted the search. So, and then, you know, per perhaps I, you know, I may appeal or I may, you know, say that the search was, uh, you know, was incomplete. Um, you know, I can challenge the method of the search. Essentially, you know, I, I'm what I'm trying to provide here is is ways in which you can empower yourself as a requester to ensure that you get all of the records that you want, at least in in in, in maybe it won't be timely, but in the most you know timely way possible. Um, having a solid template, knowing that you can go back and forth with an agency uh, and appeal multiple times if necessary um, and uh, understanding, you know, what the agency's obligation is, you know, under the law, for example, showing, you know, demonstrating that there is a, what the reasonable foreseeable harm is if they decline to, you know, provide you with records. Um, 
and uh, uh, you know, knowing that as journalists that you also have you know, the opportunity to get records on an expedited basis, that the agency has to provide you with estimated dates of completion, um, that, uh, and, and that you're entitled to a waiver of fees. So with that, um, wow, actually was speaking for an hour. So I'm happy to, you know, take some questions. Um, I also want to provide my email uh, which I'll throw in. Uh, I'm not sure if I can put it in the uh, Q and A, but um, maybe you saw it on the uh, on the template. My uh, my email is jasonleopold at gmail.com. I think what's really important for everyone to know is that, that there's a really really healthy FOIA community out there. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions and to provide help helpful tips to anyone. And the reason. Um, I often do that is because it's, it helps us as well. It helps the requesters, it helps requesters like myself to ensure that if you're, you know, asking for records in the right way, if you're appealing the right way, it, you know, it moves things along much smoother. Great. So thank you, Jason. So yeah, we do have some uh, questions in the Q&A. Uh, I will just attempt to paraphrase them, I think. Um, but I'll start with one that's hopefully a fairly straightforward answer. Could you include in information you provide the language that you use for the b6 exemption rebuttal yes i'm gonna i'll sit tom i'll send you everything and then perhaps you can I'll make it available sure. to everyone i'll make sure everyone gets copy yeah uh, right. and then so jeremy's asking back uh when you were talking at the start about expedited processing requests um how do you write that request if you're not sure what's going to be in the documents so would you so it's like if yeah. documents show what I hope they're going to show, then this would expose criminal wrongdoing, et cetera, or is it more general than that? It's a, it's a bit more general. Basically, what expedited processing is, is that you have to demonstrate that what is happening, you know, um, in the news, say, you know, um, or, uh, you know, what, what, well, let's, let's stick with, I'm going to use the election as an example. So what is happening here in the US with, you know, with the election, it's being discussed, it's, it's obviously, you know, being written about quite a bit. Um, I filed requests with the Department of Justice asking for specific records and demonstrating to them that this is a matter of, um, this is a matter of urgency. And I explained to them why it's urgent. So it's not about what's in the documents. It's essentially why you need to inform the public on an urgent basis. You know, as, as the expedited processing, um, as I mentioned, there's also, you know, an element in it where perhaps someone's life could be in danger. Now, I certainly cannot demonstrate that from the election. So, but it's very important that, you know, that I inform the public now, not six months from now when it's old news. So it's, you have to demonstrate why it's important to inform the public right now. Let's say if you know if it's Black Lives Matter protests, um, it could be you know um, uh, it, it, it could it could have to do with the fact that you know uh, maybe people's lives are at stake, or maybe there's a court you know uh, a legal proceeding that hangs in the balance. Um, so that's why it requires you to sort of just, you know, you, you, you can go on to Google and see how often people have discussed it. It's, um, I have some, again, some language I can share about that, but it's really upon the requester to demonstrate why you need these records quickly to inform the public and what will happen if you don't get them quickly. So that's, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. So it can definitely be done on a kind of more thematic topic Based. Exactly. Okay, cool. Uh, and then uh, Mario is asking, how do you know what documents are available that you can request? Are you doing pre-interviews with sources to understand uh, how to create that the section in the template? Or is that all publicly available online or is it a mix? That's a great question. So it's a mix of everything. I mean, there are instances where, like I said, if you, if you search an agency's system of record, 
it will provide you with a broader understanding of the type of records that an agency will um, uh, that an agency has that it will um, that exists. It could be an intelligence report. It could be a cable. Um, uh, so that's that's one thing. I then do you know interview sources um, and ask them you know what types of records you know they know exist. What is it called? The other thing that I that I do um, is at least on the federal level. Yeah, the state level is very, very different. And I'm sorry that we didn't really get into that here, um, but it really uh, applies to it uh, you know, on a state-by-state -state basis. Every federal agency, for the most part, has a FOIA reading room. So if you go to the bottom you know, of a federal website agency page, it'll say FOIA. It'll take you to the FOIA page. It'll, you can then navigate through the FOIA reading room and you can read the documents that are already on there. Um, and so I look through that. Again, this is just part of the, you know, the reporting process to understand what records they've already released. Um, that's why I spend time on the website to get gain an understanding of those records. Um, in addition to that, each agency has um, what they refer to as FOIA logs, where you can see what records other people are requesting. FOIA logs can be, in some instances, very good tip sheets because, you know, of all the FOIA requests that agencies receive on an annual basis, journalists only make up a sliver, a sliver of all those requests. It's commercial requesters and, and members of the general public that are requesting the vast amount of records. So you can look at the logs and kind of get an idea of what specific records other people are requesting. And again, that's a way to sort of just, you know, you're, you're, you're empowering yourself with information and gaining an understanding of, um, you know, of, of what exists there. Lastly, um, uh, you know, court cases. Um, so in, in lawsuits for specific records, agencies will often file, uh, the agencies that are being sued will file declarations. In those declarations, they describe the types of records that exist and the types of filing systems that exist. Again, I'm collecting all that information because I know that FOIA and documents are going to be so crucial to my reporting that you know I'm I'm just collecting that information and compiling it and uh, and and using it eventually. Cool. Okay, and then a couple more procedural questions. So. Um, on a curiosity around how you balance uh, between a broad request, which might take a bit longer, or a narrower, more specific request, wh wh how you decide which one to go for in, in different circumstances? It really depends on the story. Um, you know, it depends on what I'm doing. I mean, you know, I'll try to get it, like, if it's, it, it, if it's an agency that I'm asking for someone's emails, all of their emails. And even if I sue for all of those emails, it will still take, you know, uh, in some instances, a very long time to get all of that. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying, at that point, I'll kind of have a better understanding of what the story is I'm working on. So obviously everything that I'm requesting, you know, in one way or another has to deal you know, deals with pertains to a story or, or an investigative project that I'm working on. Um, so I kind of make that determination beforehand. Um, and I have asked for, you know, all emails from a specific, you know, uh, agency head before. But, um, you know, I try to, I try to more or less, you know, figure that out early on. And then, you know, if it's something that I'm looking for, if I, if I know that there's something that's, you know, more, that's, that, that I'm asking for something more, uh, quite more narrower, um, it's, it's because I want to get something out quickly. Are there instances when where you've had, like, you've put in a broad request and then you've got a bit further in the investigative process and some terms have come up and you feel like you're better off narrowing the request for specific emails which mention that term rather than 
waiting for the full emails and looking proving yourself? Yeah, there are. I mean, and that's that's happened with regard to, you know, some um, records that I was seeking on immigration policies, um, where I asked for everything, and it just made sense, you know, as the case was progressing, to kind of narrow it down to, you know, um, specific terms. And then, um, so you mentioned the pipeline, uh, but. There's also some questions around uh, how do you manage that pipeline and kind of keep on top of all of the, the yeah. requests that they come in and the ongoing ones, right? Depending. It's a good question. I mean, I don't have any, um, you know, I haven't come up with like the genius software on how I manage it. I have a spreadsheet. So this is what I do. I really do try to file, you know, at least one request per day. And it's easier for me, as I mentioned, because I have that template, right? And that template um, allows me to simply just plug in the information. So when I file my request, I have a spreadsheet and I, you know, the spreadsheet will say, you know, the, the date the request was filed. And then I have a, a column that is estimated date of completion, right? So as I mentioned, when you file a request, a couple, few weeks later, you can reach out to the agency and ask when they estimate this, this request will be complete. And I put in that column, you know, the date that, it'll, that it will be complete. And I set a calendar alert for, you know, to alert me when that, when that happens, when that date comes up. And, you know, then it, depending on what happens after that, I'll you know have a, a column for records produced or a column for an appeal. So I try to like I do have lots of calendar alerts. I look at this every day, um, and it's you know by agency. And I mean I have, um, I think I have almost maybe it's a little over five thousand requests. Um, I have seventy five lawsuits against the government. So you know. It's a full-time job, um, but I'm always looking at it. I'm always looking at when do these records do, you know. And um, in fact, I just went. I just spent one week with the Office of Director of National Intelligence, going back and forth on when they expect to, you know, to provide me with the records. You know, and they're like, "We'll let you know tomorrow. We'll let you know at this point." But it, it, it's why I try to engage in a, a conversation with these agencies, with these agency analysts because they can be your friends, you know, um, and, and, and be very, very helpful. Um, anyway. Cool. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned it's a full-time job, uh, which kind of leads me on to one of the other questions, which is, um, how much time do you spend on writing, drafting, filing lawsuits for FOIA requests as compared to kind of writing up the, the stories that come out of the FOIA document? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I spend a lot of time. Um, I'll, I'll devote one entire day to just, you know, the FOIA, um, usually on Fridays. And, uh, you know, I'm probably, you know, many, several hours, you know, just researching. Um, I, as I mentioned, I had filed a bunch of requests related to the election, you know, and that, you know, that required me doing quite a bit of research. So I think there was about, you know, four or five hours that I put into it because I, here's the thing that, that everyone should avoid, you know, don't just type a request and then just send it in and, and do it within a couple of seconds. You know, you can do, if you know what you're asking for, you've got the FOIA down that well, that's fine. But if you're looking to get records very quickly, if you're hoping that, you know, all you want them to do is just look at your request and be like, wow, this person knows exactly what they want, you know, spend some time um, conducting that research. And that's why I do that. So um, I will devote pretty much an entire day. There's an instance, I'll just tell a very quick story where um, 
you know, there are instances where I, where I will pull my car over and send a request on my phone. And that happened back in 2018 after Eminem released his new album on Twitter. He, he tweeted that his new, he, he released his new album and there was, and I started listening to it on the, on my drive home from work. And there was a song uh, on that new album where he talked about how the FBI, or no, how the Secret Service, and I don't think he specifically said Secret Service, but he discussed how, what it sounded like the Secret Service went to visit him for some threats that he made in another song, you know, about um, Donald Trump and Ivanka Trump. And I was like, what, what the heck is this? So I pulled my car over and, you know, I got my template out and I fired off a request. And it simply said, any records that, that the Secret Service has on Eminem, also known as, you know, Marshall Mathers. That's it. That's all I pretty much wrote in my request. And then I forgot about it. And that took me like just a few seconds. You know, a year later, um, I'm flying into DC. I get off the plane. And I look at my email and there is an email there from Secret Service. And I'm like, huh, what is this? And it's, it was these records on Eminem. And I was like, holy shit. These were act, like, they actually gave me, like it was, first of all, the records were amazing. Um, and you know, I ended up writing a story about it. And it sur turns out that the Secret Service investigated Eminem for, you know, for perceived threats against Donald Trump and Ivanka Trump. So, my point is, is that I'm constantly thinking of documents and, you know, there are instances where it's like, oh, that's something easy. I can just fire off that request. And then there's, you know, other, other instances where it's like, I want to, I want to put some time into this. Yeah. So I've been talking about um, sparking ideas. There is a question about, um, are there any kind of interesting resources that people might not have thought of to spark ideas for requests besides yes. and songs? Yeah, there's, uh, there's lots. In fact, as I mentioned there, you know, here's what I use. I'm, whenever I'm reading news stories, for example, um, news stories can sometimes be a tip sheet for me. In many news stories, you know, they may talk about a memo or a document or maybe a letter was sent. Um, that's a me and if they're not disclosing what that document is, and I will tell you oftentimes they don't, um, I'm, I want that, I want that document, you know? So news stories will sometimes be a tip sheet and I read it one to get the news and then I scrutinize it to see if they're talking about any specific record that may exist. Um, particularly stories that have to do with intelligence or stories lately about Afghanistan or about any sort of like operation. As I mentioned also the FOIA logs, right? The FOIA logs are fascinating for any agency. And it's fascinating because, as I mentioned, most of the records that are being requested are not from journalists. They're from other people. And they're, they're, there are instances where they are very, very, very specific. So, it, you know, sometimes there are people who used to work at the agency, you know, and they're asking for certain records. It's like, whoa, what is this record about? So I, I look at the FOIA logs as tip sheets. I'll look at the, you know, an agency's website and um, look at the publications, right? Every agency will say, you know, publications or news releases. And again, trying to get an understanding of what these agencies do um, as, as a way of, um, you know, s seeing what, what types of records uh, I can ask for. Um, yeah, so that's, and, and I'll look at other, you know, other people's requests, you know, as well. Um, and I read the, you know, as I mentioned, the records that they've already released. They may release records on their FOIA reading room. So I, those spark ideas for me. Um, once you get a kind of understanding of, you know, the types of records that an agency maintains and stores, again, it just becomes easier to, you know, to understand what's there uh, and, and what to request. You know, I, I will say that it's it's often still, very often right now, people are not requesting text messages. I request text messages. They're, they're, they're providing text messages. 
text messages are fascinating. I mean, it's pretty amazing to see what, you know, what goes into text messages. Yeah, still on um, story ideas, actually. Uh, so do you always have a hunch or a tip off or um, some data behind a request? Or do you ever do kind of fishing expeditions where you're just looking to see what's out there? Yeah, good question. So I will, for the most part, I'm, I, I do know what I'm requesting, you know, but I do do fishing expeditions, but fishing expeditions for specific types of records. And let me give an example. Um, every federal agency has an inspector general, a watchdog that kind of watches over what is taking place, you know, within, you know, the agency. So, um, the watchdog will investigate issues related to waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, the watchdog will investigate allegations of, you know, whistleblower retaliation. Uh, watchdog is a very important component, and the watchdog, you know, will will write reports, and oftentimes those reports are not public. So with the intelligence agencies, because everything the intelligence agencies do are, is for the most part classified, um, there are instances often, you know, maybe every few years where I will file requests with, you know, the CIA or the NSA um, for all inspector general reports covering 2020 through whatever. And so I don't know what's in those reports but I'm actually just asking for all of that. And oftentimes it'll be, you know, something will come where it's, you know, where it's interesting. That, I'd call that a bit of a fishing expedition. It's also a way to kind of keep tabs on what is happening within an agency. Um, you know, there were instances, uh, you know, years ago where I would file requests for records about, you know, the treatment of, uh, of detainees captured after 9-11. You know, I, I didn't know what was there. That was a bit of a fishing expedition. So, um, but I do try to keep it, you know, I, I usually do have a hunch on a story. Um, and, you know, I, I know what I'm looking for, particularly if I'm going to court. Yeah, and even with uh, fishing expeditions, you're kind of targeting it. So it's kind of spear fishing rather than trawler. Right. A fishing expedition. Look, a very easy request for anyone here to do is, is, you know, asking an agency to process the last 20 emails sent and received by an agency head. That's a very easy request. That'll give you one. You don't know what's in those emails. Maybe there's something interesting. It'll allow you to kind of keep tabs on it. Um, you know, and, and on, you know, on the official or, or the agency in general. Um, again, these are good sort of practices to get into. You can ask for those records. You don't necessarily, you know, maybe there is a story there, or maybe it's just a way to kind of become familiar with the agency, what's happening within the agency. You know, you go to USA.gov and look up at all of the federal agencies that exist. There's, you know, more than 300, I believe. You know, so uh, take your pick. Okay, and then one other um, slightly specific question, I guess. Um, have you got any tips for freelancers who don't have resources behind them, A, to file lawsuits when it comes to that, but I guess also, does it matter when you're requesting a fee waiver if you don't have kind of a large portfolio behind you? Yeah, so that's a good question. One, for freelancers, I mean, there are resources, you know, for, for lawsuits. One, um, there's a there's a clinic at Yale. I mean, it's very kind of specific. Uh, the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the uh, Freedom of the Press, um, you know, can can reach out to them. Uh, I believe uh, Society of Professional Journalists also have you know resources if if you're looking to sue. And there are you know there are lawyers out there um, happy to provide you know some information. I mean, depending on it, uh, depending on you know, what you're looking for. With regards to getting a fee waiver, um, yeah, no, you could still get a fee waiver even if you're freelance. You don't have to have a large portfolio. You just have to demonstrate that you're, 
you know, one that the that the records that you're, you're that you're seeking that you're you're going to you know you're not using it for commercial purposes, um, and you know as long as you've published before, um, that you know that's fine. That you just have to sort of demonstrate that. Maybe there's a link to you know a previous story um, or your own author page. Okay, cool. And then one more question about. Um... If you're writing, say, a long story or even a book about an individual person, um, what kind of recommendations would you have for your wives to find out across multiple agencies whether there are records about that specific person? Yeah, so that depends if the person is alive or dead. Um, you know, one thing you cannot do unless you have a waiver from that person is you cannot request records. Um, on a, on a living person, um, or rather you can request them, the agency is just gonna deny you the records because you need to have a, a waiver. Um, and, um, but if the person is deceased, you can simply just, you know, put a request together. And I've done, I do this regularly all the time. Yeah. If a person is deceased, um, you know, I, I file requests with multiple agencies just saying any and all records that, you know, that you have on, you know, Joe Smith, um, that, uh, that's it. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, for the FBI, those are the, FBI is the most common agency to file a request with for, for, um, you know, for, for individuals, um, it can get a little bit more dicey with some of the other agencies, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, if you're looking for multiple agencies, I mean, I just put together the same request and just send it off to the all the different agencies. Just remember to change with CIA. From to exactly, FBI. yes, yes. Okay. okay. Um, cool, I think that is all of the questions we had. Uh, and we are just about coming off on time. Um, but yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you, Jason, for giving up your time for this. I think My pleasure. Yeah. Useful for everyone. Um, we will have a recording up on the website um, fairly soon, and we'll try and get all of those resources out to people as well. Thanks, everyone. And, and again, I'm, uh, I'm available if anyone has any questions. Much appreciated, Jason. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. And thank everyone for attending.